Can't hear you, coach. Go, go, good, good afternoon, Victor. How are you? I'm good, coach. How are you? I'm fine. Look, how is coach? How are you? How uh, is fine, coach. <laughs> A bit chilly, but okay. Okay, Zambia is also okay. How is Club yeah. Dial, Victor? He is well. He's well. With the comrade Jonathan Moyo. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan Moyo is no longer in this government. Oh, uh -uh. <laughs> he ran away <laughs> with the Mugabe's. And he's not in the triple C. No, he's not. I may be indirectly. But, but, but in you're, you're, you're part of the G40, was it? Yes, he was. He was. <laughs> okay. Okay. He's in Kenya. Oh, mm. <laughs> it's a very interesting right? character. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so today, guys, at least we've started looking at the lighter things now. It's just standards. So I'm thinking, I know we we'll have a bit of some time. I think we'll be able to do three standards today. IS-19, I'll deliberately not do it up to maybe over the weekend so that you, you have it as part of your, your toolkit. It's a very interesting standard as well. So today we'll look at components under, under the non-current assets, but we'll look at two out of four, because under the non-current assets, we have IS-16 that looks at proper plant and equipment. We have IS-20 that looks at the government grants. is 23 that looks at borrowings and IS 40 that looks at investment property. So today we we'll only look at two of the four standards under non-current assets. We will look at borrowings, and it's very interesting because there are some few things that I just want to, 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 to talk about at national level. <laughs> then we we'll also look at government grants. Then we'll divert a bit and go to IS2 on inventory, and that is how we are going to close our time today or our work. So, under borrowing cost, how should borrowings be treated? These are the things that we we'll need to be looking at as we as we get into into detail. We know that companies borrow, and by 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 theory and even practice is that debt is cheaper than equity so it is wise for countries and companies alike to borrow but when they borrow what are what are they trying to create there should be an asset that is being created so they there will be an issue of after borrowing, there's a phase, if there's an asset that is supposed to be created, there'll be a period at which the money that you have borrowed, you are building your assets, you are using to build your assets. And that is during construction. So if it is during construction, what happens? How do you treat those interests that are being incurred and you are actually paying? You may not be paying, it may be peak, paid in current, meaning that you start paying after the project starts giving you revenues. But at that time, th that particular cost, if it becomes peak, it should be expensive because then it actually goes into compounding mode. So we'll be looking at all those things. But then there's this IDC, which is interest during construction. You need to know that we always have to capitalize it. But in the times where you maybe there's strike, there's industrial unrest, and you cannot do anything for a month, whatever expenses that you incur during that time, whatever interest that you incur during that time, you need not to capitalize it. That interest has to be expensed because at that time, that cost generated was never associated to the asset that you are building. We may also be facing 
certain challenges. Challenges where you have this project that you're doing and, and this is normal for most of these big projects that we undertake. We don't only use one source of financing, no. So if you are borrowing, there will be made a senior note. You have, for example, a junior note. You can even have a portfolio of three types of loans. So you have senior debt, you have junior debt, which will come in as mezzanine, and any other form of debt. Some extent, you may also want to get a revolver. Revolver then becomes like a credit line, which is obviously, it's short term in nature. But there are expenses that are incurred. But if you are using those funds to build an asset, during construction, when your asset hasn't reached at the stage where it's supposed to generate revenue, all those costs will need to be capitalized. They are part of your project cost. Victor, are you getting me? Look. Yes. Yes, coach. Mm -hmm. So if you have different sources of financing, and it's, come, it's coming out, it has, it, you are actually getting these funds at different terms. Maybe the first one you're getting at 4%, 4 the other one 5%, the other one, the last one maybe at 8%. And first take note about this. The senior loan note or term note is always cheap, even the interest is cheap because the risk that they are carrying, the senior lenders, the risk they are carry, carrying are much, much lower oh, at, at, at the village. I don't in the class, Datoma. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a village person, eh? hey. <laughs> Someone wants to update me about, about my kettles, how they are today. <laughs> so, okay, we can go on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you have a situation where you have different uh, sources of financing with different uh, terms. The interest rates are different. But there's this particular project that you need to apply whatever funds that you're getting from all these three sources of financing in building that asset. But then these loans, they are coming at different rates. You will need to find ways of coming up with a weighted average rate that weighted average rate, that is the one that you're actually going to use to apply on a project. Because this project, it has different sources of financing, different rates, and it's actually being dispersed or you're making drawdowns at different times. So we'll actually be looking at that and how you can treat it nicely. But just take it as a matter of fact that all cost interest charges that are incurred during construction, what we call IDC, those costs have to be capitalized so that you actually increase the cost of investment or your capex. But even during construction, if those industrial unrest, there's some idle time for a period of, 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 of time of some kind, which you are able to ascertain how much interest you paid during that period of inactivity, that interest has to be expensed. Now we can start. Can someone, sorry. I'm in, I'm in class, can I call you after 30 minutes? Okay, okay.
Hello, guys, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so let's look at this particular uh, project, the Kazungula Bridge. You know, this project is actually maybe it was funded, so though there was some money from somewhere, but it was basically funded by a number of countries. Uh, what's the context of the project? It's a key road and rail bridge crossing over the Zambezi River along the north-south corridor. So you know the, the, the thing there. That's kind of disturbances today. What what is that to my name class? Okay, okay. Okay, so this is basically the context of this particular project. I know you know it, so will not take a lot of time. Every project, there is a gap that is actually being addressed. So we have the reasons, the gap that we are trying to address. That is the, all the, is it three or four countries? That's Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Namibia. Mm -hmm. And this is how the financing was for this particular project. The total project cost was approximately 259.3 million, funded through a co-financing co arrangement with JICA. So the bank covers 50, 51 million UA, I'm sure it's from Dubai or whatever, from ADF window. The balance is shared between JICA, which is 57.5%, Governments 9.2% and the EU ITF grant of 1.8%. Mm -hmm. So, what is the, although I've already explained what this IS33 is on borrowing costs, but the overview requires that borrowing costs directly attributed to the acquisition, construction, or production of a qualifying asset, one that necessarily takes a substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or sale. I included in the cost of whom? the asset. I did actually explain to you that all the costs that will be incurred, interest costs or charges that will be incurred during construction, what we call IDC, those costs will actually need to be capitalized. They are part of the project cost. So the objective of IS23 is to prescribe the accounting treatment for borrowing costs. I've already explained how that prescription has to be done. So the interest expense calculated by the effective interest method under I state nine, which we'll look at. So there are all these other things that may actually include finance charges on the IFRS 16, which used to be I 17 on leases. I know these are standards that we'll be looking at next week as we start winding up. Mm -hmm. Hi, Coach. Hello. Oh, on the previous slide, is it before this one? this one? No, the one before that. Uh, next one. The next, I think. No, no, no. Uh, going forward. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. Or it's yes. other borrowing costs. Yes. Because you were saying they need to be capitalized. So you mean no, it's other, other uh, borrowing mm. ah, well, That's fine. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've already explained in details. I know you will have access to the presentation, but I've actually explained how these borrowings need to be, they need to be accounted for. So I'm so much eager just to look at the, the, 
the computations what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So we start and the talk will be ending soon. <laughs> The, the question here is Zambia commenced the construction of toll gates across the country on 1st March 2018 and funded it with a 10 million loan. The rate of interest on the borrowings was 5%. Due to a strike, no construction took place between 1st October and 1st November. Calculate the amount of interest to be capitalized as per to, to of non-current assets if Zambia's reporting date is the 1st December 2018. So this is what the Zambian government would do. So from 1st March, to 31st December. Look, which is how many months? Victor, how many months from 1st March to 31st December? That's about uh, 10 months. It's 10 months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was a month of inactivity. That was from 1st October to 1st November. This month, it was inactive. So meaning that we only remain with nine months of the interest, nine months worth of interest that we will need to capitalize. So for this one is no brain at all because we only have one source of financing, but then we have nine months divided by 12 times 5%. Basically here, this 5% is annual. So we are saying if it's 5% equals to 12 months, how many, what would be the percentage for only nine months? So whatever we have here times 10 million. So we'll know the cost. What would be the cost? Three seventy five thousand should be. So it should be three seventy five thousand or zero point three seven million. Mm -hmm. Okay, agreed. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the second thing here now, this is a scenario that I was explaining. You have three different types of loans. So let me just read it out. Zambia defaulting bank loans in issue during 2018. 4% uh, bank loan, they got a 20 million. Then they got a 35 million loan, which had a much lower interest rate of 3%. They also got a 15, uh, 15 million, which had an interest charge of 2.5%. The narrative reads, Zambia commenced the construction of an item of property plant and equipment on 1st January 2018 
for which it used its existing borrowings. <laughs> 10 million of expenditure was used on 1st January. 15 million was used on 1st July and 8 million was issued on 1st October or was used, sorry, on 1st October. So we have 10 million, 15 million and 8 million. So if we are to use the interest rate, which interest rate are we going to use from this? How are we going to know that what we have used is coming from the 20 million loan? Or what we have used is coming from 35 million loan? Or indeed from 15 million? How? Victor, help me. We use weighted average. So we are going to use weighted average. If we are given specifics, it was going to be very easy. Then we're going to use interest based on those specifics. But we're not given that. So this is what we're going to do. We need to find the interest here. It's 4% times 20, 3% times 35, and 2.5% times 15. Give me the numbers. Four times 20, 4% 4 times 20. Is it 0 0.8? Hello? Yes, it's 0 0.8, sorry, I was on mute. Then 3% times that 5. Uh, that's uh, 1.05. 1 1.05. Then 2.5% times 15. 0.375. What? 0 0.375. 0 0.375. So we'll have to find that we we'll have to sum these numbers. Two point two two. Two point two. Two two. Two two. Two five. Two point two. Two two five. Two two five. So this is your interest. Two two five, coach. Two two five. Two point two two five. 2.225, oh, okay, sorry. Like this? Yes. So we will then now need to get the weighted tariff. I think, oh, yeah, I'm used to tariff. We'll now get the weighted, <laughs> the weighted rate, sorry. So it's 2.225. 2. Divided by the total here, what's the sum of all these loans? 70 million. 70? 70, yeah. Yeah. So times 100.
that's 3.18. 3.18. Now we can answer the question with less challenges. So we have 3.18. So this is what we're going to do. On 1st January, 2018, there's a 10 million. So let me just get this. Okay, so there were three loans. The first loan at three point, so the first loan, they made a drawdown on 1st January of 10 million, watch. So we know that the accounting period or the financial year is from 1st January to 31st December. So meaning that we'll have the interest will to be 10 million times 3.18%. This one gives us 0. Point 318, do not use a calculator here, please. Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Kunjani, 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 are you okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are okay. Okay. We are okay. So the second loan, Second loan, it was 15 million on 1st July. 15 million on 1st July. Fifteen million. So from 1st July, to the first December, it is how many months? Six months, right? Yeah. So do like this times six over 12 times 3.18 percent. Two three point uh, zero point two three eight. Zero point two three eight. Two three eight. Mm -hmm. Then we have the third one. Eight million was used on. Okay, 8 million was used on 1st October, 8 million. So on 1st October, we have 8 million. So it's 8 million times 1st October up to December 31st. It should be three months, right? Three months, yeah. Yeah, three months. Mm -hmm. 
So three over 12 times 3.18%. The point zero six four. Mm -hmm. What? Zero point zero six four. Zero point zero six four. Mm. So we need to add so that we get the total cost. Point zero mm -hmm. six twenty. What? Point zero point six two zero. Two six zero. Yeah. Six two. Six two eight. Point six two. Okay. Point six two. Like this, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this will be your total cost that you're actually going to capitalize. Meaning that you take the balance sheet to be part of your property plant and equipment. <coughs> it sits as part of your non-current assets. So any borrowing costs that you are going to incur during construction, those costs must and should always be expressed. And the reasoning there is simple. Is that at that time you're constructing your power station, you are constructing your, your plant. During that time, your project is not expected to generate any revenues. So any interest during construction has to be capitalized. So any interest or borrowing cost here that you're going to incur after commercial operation of your project, those costs, they will need to be expensed. Because as indirectly, it is thought that those costs, they are helping you to generate revenues. And therefore, you have to apply matching concept that states that revenues end must be matched against expenses incurred in any of them. Okay, sorry. So we are done on borrowing costs. You read some detail, but there's nothing much uh, about these standards as long as you understand the application of them. So then we transition into IS 20 on government grants. So allow me to go to, to government grants.
Mm -hmm. So we now go to government grants. We'll look at the conditions under government grants. Sometimes we always think that government grants are free, at least the citizens, most of the citizens. Sometimes government grants may be defined as government grants when you are actually getting a loan below the market rate. We have already looked at the borrowings. Most of the companies and countries or nations, they are confronted with so much borrowings. Some may not, they are not even in a better position to take account or inventory of their borrowings. They cannot show what assets were created because of those borrowings. So today we then now go to government grants and we just need to check on the technique, the accounting treatment that is supposed to be impressed on all those that we call as government grants and qualify to be government grants. We'll start with one special project that was actually undertaken in Zambia, then it was with the drone at some point, the Millennium Challenge account, I think it was Compact One. In February 20, 2017, the Millennium Challenge account, Zambia Limited, celebrated the signing of contracts with nine private sector organizations who have been awarded, who were awarded grants worth about $3 million to implement various innovative projects in water supply, sanitation, and drainage that are aimed at improving lives of beneficiary communities. What gap was being addressed? Because when you are giving this grant, there is a gap that you are trying to address. So you guys who are consultants, you need to know that if there is a particular project that needs to be undertaken and, and the company that has consulted you requires that they get some sort of financing, you always need to know the gap. What is this gap are they trying to address? In this case, on the Millennium Challenge, this is the gap that was being addressed. So the innovative grants awards that were assigned are part of the $355 million to Saka Water and uh, Supply Sanitation and Drainage Project funded by the United States government through the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And saying the project is being implemented by MCA Zambia. Six contractors are, are at, at currently at various stages of construction and the expansion of the infrastructure. So we know what they were trying to to, to, to address. Well, I think once completed, this project will benefit residents in many parts of Lusaka. So that is the gap they were trying to address this particular gap. So IS-20, the first time it was issued was in 1983. And it was applicable on the 1st January 1984. And this is the overview. It outlines how to account for government grants and other assistance. Government grants are recognized in profit or loss on a systematic basis over the periods in which the entity recognizes expenses for the related costs. Let me just explain this without going into details. This is what it is. Living in this in a, in a city, guys, it, it, it generates a lot of stress. Ah, I don't I, I don't know. Maybe I should come to to, to Harare, Victor or Avoron. <laughs> but to some guys, it's difficult. We are always tired, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to hustle here and there. 
Matthias. Mm. Maybe I should come to Harare. So on government grants, for example, you have an asset, you are, maybe there's some asset that you, you have bought. Say you bought this asset at 25 million. And this proper plant and equipment, its economic lifespan is say 10 years. But then what is, what is there, the team, is that there's maybe some grant coming from, from JICA, for example, of 4 million as a grant from JICA. For sure, once this grant comes in, it hits your account. It's your bank. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there'll be cash on the, on the first half of the balance sheet as an asset. Then, down there, there will be a liability. Now, this liability, which will come in on the second half of the balance sheet, this is what they will call as the deferred. Deferred income. This is income that has been deferred. Mm -hmm. That's 4 million. So then it will show as under liability, So under liability, it will show, it will be obvious under non-current liabilities, but this asset, the proper plant and equipment will be depreciated every year. So the depreciation every year is expected to be 2.5, isn't it? 2.5 million, because the economic lifespan of this particular asset is 10 years. Similarly, you need to apply using the same economic lifespan of the asset that has generated that grant. So meaning that this grant as well, will need to amortize it by 10 years, giving us 0.5. For in amortization every year. So before the year end, what is going to happen is that we are going to have under non-current liabilities. Please get me right. Under non-current liabilities, we will have deferred income of three point six. Then under current liabilities, we'll have 0 0.4 sitting as deferred income. That is before the year end. At the year end, this is what is going to happen. This will be canceled. Because then at that period, you need to amortize. So this 0 0.4 will go into the P and L. As amortization. With it. So that by the end of the 10th year, 
this deferred income, which is a liability, will be zero, zero. It's a liability in the sense that you have been given this, like, this particular grant with conditions. And it is sitting in your bank account and you need to continue amortizing until everything is done. So if you meet only one year of that condition, that is what you are going to regard as the amortization. And this amortization comes in and get me right, it is not an expense at all. It is coming in as other income because on top there you have 2.5 that is coming in as a depreciation. So that when you, you net it, you have 2.1 net effect. So what was deferred income now is realized as income because you have done your amortization. So that by the end of the 10th year, you have zero deferred income. There will only be 0 0.4 of your deferred income, which will be the last chunk. Shamari, are you getting me? Uh, and I'm lost. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm getting you. <laughs> Let me but, use uh, a plain paper. A whiteboard, yeah. Plain mm -hmm. paper. The electronic plain paper. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll do it very slow, slowly but sure. What we are actually saying is that there's an asset you have gotten as a company. This property plant and equipment, Victor, is worth 25 million. Right? So as a company, this asset, property plant and equipment you have gotten, which is like 5 million. But then you have a very good Samaritan who in this case is Jaika. Provides, towards this proper grant and equipment, provides a grant of 4 million grant. Mm -hmm. So we agree that annual depreciation every year, there will be depreciation. First, we say economic lifespan. Of this asset is 10 years. So according to the standard, even the grant that has been uh, provided to question or to support the acquisition of that property plant and equipment will also be 10 years. So it will hit here, it will also hit there. So then what it means Annual depreciation So what it means annual depreciation for the proper plant and equipment, which is basically depreciation here, will be 2.5 million. We are assuming that the depreciation method you're actually using is a straight line. Mm -hmm. Victor, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Follow me. Yeah. So what it means as well, your annual 
año o ieri. Amortization. Will be four divided by 10, it will be 0 0.4. Zero point four million <clears throat> per year. Mm -hmm. So this is what is going to happen. Is that in the balance sheet, or in the system before the year end, so to say, you will have cash from this particular grant mm -hmm. of 4 million. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this 4 million, it comes in as long as the last half of the balance sheet hasn't been taken care of, the balance sheet is not going to balance. So what now you call a statement of financial position is not going to balance. So this 4 million has come in, Jack has given you, it's actually sitting in your bank. So under liabilities, this is before year end, under liabilities, you will have non-current liabilities, you will have deferred income of 3.6. Then you have what is actually going to be amortized or to be, to be, yeah, what is going to be amortized at the end of the year, which will come in as current liabilities. Also deferred income. It's deferred income because this is income that you've gotten and you, it's still, you would look at it that it's going to be realized in the future. So deferred income, which is a liability as well, which will be 0 0.4. At the year end, At the year end, this 0 0.4, which was deferred income has been actualized. So it will now come in as in amortization from your grant. You can even put now grant in your income statement. Let me do this so that hmm, we move systematically. <laughs> so at year end, In the P and L, it will come in now as grant because you have amortized it of 0 0.4. This is an income. Then under expenses, this is on income and other income. If you want, you can just say other income. On expenses, you'll have depreciation of 2.5, such that the next depreciation will be just 2.1. Grant is coming of 0 0.4 as an income, depreciation of 2.5. Remember that that particular asset of 25 million, there's 21 million where you use your own money or we don't know where you got the money from, but there's a 4 million which is coming <coughs> as a grant. So this is what is going to happen. But then, in the balance sheet, or what you are now calling a statement of financial position, I'm sure an old school, so I'm not going to use that. This side, now you're actually going to show 
you are going to show your property plant and equipment. Which will be 22.5, right? Then you have cash. Let's assume that the cash remains as 4 million. Hmm. Then, under, under liabilities, which gives us this one, will give us 26.5. Under liabilities, here we're assuming there's no equity. So at the end of the year, you will have just 3.6. Then <laughs> under equity, because of your profit that you are going to make, you have this amount that will come and sit there because it's a factor of your retained earnings. This one, we have removed it from that side. So you have 0 0.4 that will come and sit here. So under share capital, this is other components of equity, other components of equity. Your share capital, we assume that you have your 22.5 that you use, not 22.5. That is for you have 21. Yeah, 22.5. So it will give you, 26.5. So if I'm in modeling, this is how I would actually model it. If I'm modeling. Do you want to have a proper picture of the grants, how you account yeah, for them? I have a, uh, yes, I have a, I have the proper picture. Victor, are you happy now? Can yes, we proceed? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Yes, we can. Look, does it make sense? Yes, coach, it does. Mm -hmm. This time now, guys, there's no time to start cramming, cramming. It's just a logic. We use logic, you apply it, and that's what you're going to apply in your exams. Mm -hmm. So, we get back there. Okay, so the objective of IS-20 is to prescribe the accounting for and disclosure of government grants and other forms of government assistance. Now it's just a theory on the scope. So IS-20 applies to all government grants and other forms of government assistance. However, it does not cover government assistance that is provided in the form of benefits in determining taxable income. Because then there's no asset to it. So you cannot, you cannot, it cannot be covered under this. It does not cover government grants covered by IS-41. If you're dealing with the agricultural biological assets. So if it's biological assets where you buy on your farm, you buy 10 heifers, then JICA also gives you a component, maybe 25% of that. That amount is not going to be covered under IS-20. <laughs> to be covered under IS-41 on investments. So the benefit of a government loan at a below market rate of interest is treated as a government grant. <laughs> so as long as you have gotten that particular loan from the government and it is below the market rate, that is also going to be regarded as a grant. Mm -hmm.
Now hear this. You know, those that were crafting this standard, it's, it's like they lived in Africa and they understand politicians so well. Hear what, 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 what the standard says. A government grant is recognized only when there is reasonable assurance that A, the entity will comply with any conditions attached to the grant. First, the recipient, the, the organization that is receiving this grant shall comply with any conditions. So even those that give the grants to governments, this is why at some point they will withdraw the grants when they realize that the government is not uh, complying to set and agreed conditions. First one. Second one, which is B, the grant will be received. <laughs> the grant will be received. Other than you who is supposed to receive it, comply, but also the one who is giving you that grant, there should be an assurance that it will be received. Most of these grants or pronouncements by politicians that say, no, we are going to provide 200 million Zimbabwean dollars. Most of the time it is just for the camera, just for ZBC to see and to harvest the votes, possible votes from gullible citizens. They don't pay back. So you need, there must be an assurance. Victor, are you getting this? Yes, I'm getting it. <laughs> so the grant is recognized as income over the period necessary to match them to the related costs for which they intended to purpose it on a systematic basis. I've already demonstrated to you how this deferred income concept comes in. Non-monetary grants such as land or other resources are usually accounted for at fair value. Although rec recording both the asset and the grant at a nominal amount is also permitted. So there the standard is not restrictive. Even if there are no conditions attached to the assistance, specifically relating to the operating activities of the entity, other than requirements to operate in certain regions or industry sectors, such grants should not be credited to equity. They shouldn't be credited because a, a, the company, a company can, in trying to reduce that, remember that a grant is going to be regarded as a liability. And this is what comes in as a deferred income. So most, if most companies, what they'll do, they'll convert that grant to equity. <laughs> so that even when you're doing your ratios, your ratios, your debt ratios, and all these other things, oh, oh, they will be within acceptable means. But the standard says, no, 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 no. Even if this particular grant hasn't come with conditions, do not be clever to credit to equity. It should not be part of equity. It should come in as a liability. Look, does it make sense? Yes, coach, it does. Mm -hmm. There's no need to go and reread re these things. It's just now final. Let them be in your mind, in your, in your, in your, in your, in your scope of donors, like others would call it here. <laughs> so let <laughs> keep them in your brains. Let them be registered in memory, and we move on. It's just a concept, and it's very practical. A grant receivable as compensation for costs already incurred or for immediate financial support with no future related costs should be recognized as income in the period in which it is receivable. Because there are no costs attached to, there is no project that is whatever, all these things are already passed. So regard it as just income, it's a present. So a grant relating to assets may be presented in one of two ways, as deferred income, which I've already shown you, or by deducting the grant from the assets carrying amount. <coughs> I'd rather use the deferred income rules. Hmm. So there are other just conditions, the theories that you can, you can use for your write-up. And there, one and the same thing. <coughs> Disclosure of government grants. I've already shown you what to do here. So government grants do not include government assistance 
whose value cannot be reasonably measured. So if you cannot measure the value of what the government has given you, then it should not be regarded and it's not be regarded as a, as a grant, such as technical or marketing advice. You can't. Mm -hmm. So these are just the points to remember. Recognize the grant when the entity will comply with the conditions attached to the grant. Entity will actually receive the grant. Grant should be recognized according to the deferred income approach using a semantic basis. If the grant is used to buy the budget, after the grant must be spread over the same period and using the same method, we should have already been expected. So we have this example, similar to what we have looked at. I'll just talk through it. Pep bought an item. Pep bought an item of proper plant and equipment for 10 million and they received a government grant of 2 million. The PPE has a useful life of 10 years and has no residue value. Explain how the purchase of the proper plant and equipment and government grant would be dealt with in the financial statements of PEP. So in this case, we know that you have one million quarter <coughs> as depreciation, annual depreciation. We'll also have, is it 0 0.2? 0 0.2 quarter or million quarter which will come in as amortization. <coughs> the first two million first will be regarded as deferred income, like we had actually, we did actually show. So let me just explain these things because I've already explained them. The proper plant and equipment will be capitalized on the statement of financial position. Yes. It will be depreciated over 10 years, use of life. Yes, we even know the value. The depreciation will actually go in the pro proper plan and equip in the income statement. Yes, the accumulated depreciation will be there to discount the original cost of the proper plan and equipment. Yes, the government grant is for a depreciable asset, and so the two million will be spread over the same life as the PPE. Yes, as PEP has met a condition for the grant, the two million will be recognized as deferred income with the statement of financial position. We agree, yes. It will be spread amortized over 10 years and therefore 0.2 million income will be shown in profit or loss <laughs> each year with the deferred income being reduced by the same amount each year, yes. PEP will also split the deferred income at the reporting date between the current and non-current liabilities, which I did already demonstrate to you, yes. The statement of cash flows will show a payment to acquire PPE of 10 million and grant income of 2 million in investing activities. It's coming grant as 2 million because it's part of the investing. So it will show in there. The 10 million will come in as, as an expense, <coughs> as a cash outflow. The 2 million will come in as a cash inflow. So it will net off giving you 8 million. The depreciation and amortization of government grants are both non-cash items in profit or loss, and will need adjusting in operating activities if using the indirect method. Yes, because you have already taken care of that 10 million that has come in as cash in the cash, in the balance sheet under cash. So all these amortization you are using, they are just accounting for accounting purposes. There is no true cash movement that is there, and therefore any profit or loss that is recorded on those items shall actually be regarded as a non-cash item. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. Mm -hmm. yes. So we'll then now quickly, to, we'll quickly go into the, I have another class though, we'll quickly go into inventory. I know I gave you the notes on inventory, just these two that I haven't given you. You remember that, eh? Yeah long time ago, long, long time ago. <laughs> I just stick through them. We have, I don't have enough time. So yeah, it's just two pages. They have, in those notes, if you have seen, I've designed them in such a way that 
we have the frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. So on inventory, it's actually managed or guided by IS2. Mm -hmm. So under inventory, what are the objectives? One is to determine the initial measurement of inventory assets. Two is to understand the cost formulas that are permitted by IS2. So we'll be looking at the net realizable value and all those things. Three is to calculate the appropriate carrying amount of inventory at the reporting date. Four is to test inventories for impairment by applying the lower of cost or net realizable value calculation to end <laughs> inventory. So when you are trying to value inventory, you pick the lower between the two. The NRV, the net realizable value, or the cost. So any of the two which is lower, that is what you pick and include it in your, it's just basically prudence anyway. Determine the appropriate measurement of cost of sales for a reporting period. So inventory, you know that we'll use different valuation methods. You have FIFO, you have LIFO and all those things. Mm -hmm. We even have, is it a weighted average? You remember those things in the costing. Mm -hmm. So the cost of inventory should comprise of the three things here, guys. One is the cost of the purchase, you, the cost at which you're purchasing this particular inventory. Secondly, is the cost of conversion. If you are converting it, maybe you have to turn it into cheese. So whatever cost that you have to incur in turning milk into cheese, that cost will actually sit as part of your inventory. Other costs incurred in bringing the inventories to their present location and conditions, also that has to be included. So these are just basically slightly in deeper in a form, just narratives in deeper form what this cost of purchase means, what the conversion costs mean. <coughs> so you have to look at all those direct labor and other costs that will be incurred as long as they're production in nature those will need to be accounted for. Accounted for. Mm -hmm. These are things that you need to exclude, the abnormal amounts of wasted materials. You remember in costing, we used to look at normal losses, abnormal losses and the like. So as long as it is abnormal, then it is an expense. And that has to, should not be part of your costings. The storage costs, unless these costs are necessary in the production process, Unless it's cheese and maybe wine, where you're saying you're storing it as a process to have a final product, that cost then you can incur it. You can have it as part of inventory. But any other cost, no, it will come in just as another period, uh, period cost. Is it a cost in cut after you've produced? Administrative uh, overheads, those are indirect uh, non production costs, selling costs, borrowing costs. We know where to take borrowing costs, except that inventory is requiring a substantial period of time to make. If they take time to make, so those borrowing costs, obviously now you will need to capitalize it and they will be managed under IS-23. So you have the inventory cost formulas, you fill fund all these other things. Mm -hmm. The net realizable value, so it's basically your, your selling price less your cost to, com to complete. We looked at the NRIV at some point, I don't know. I think we are looking at, is it I said six or so? Mm -hmm. So these are just frequently asked questions that you can go through. But tomorrow we'll look at, again, two standards. I may look at three, but two which are guaranteed. One is, it's rough. Being in Lusaka, Victor. That's right. That's right. <laughs> ah! <laughs> it's, I think I should. Big I, institution. Yeah? You work for a big institution. Ah! <laughs> you, so your work is demanding. I, I need to go to the village, I'm telling you. Because there I'll just be hitting Keto. That's what I'll be doing. <laughs> <laughs>
-hmm. so, so tomorrow we are guaranteed to look at two standards so that we complete the whole non-current asset standards. We'll look at IS-16, which is on proper plant and equipment. Then we'll also look at IS-40, which is the investment property. So I'll send all the necessary notes, I'm sure, today. Uh, I'll check if there'll be uh, any easy standard that we can uh, have as well, we'll do that. So it's just standard, 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 standards. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow is Wednesday, sorry. So it's Thursday. Eh? So it's two, can do Thursday, yeah. Uh, so, but I can send more and I'll also send some videos. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's time to, to check out. I'll start with look. Uh, thank you, Coach. Um, I think um, I got the basics on the standards that we we looked at, um, and I think I uh, will look forward to looking at um, uh, any questions that are directly uh, linked to these standards, mm -hmm. just to make sure that I use uh, logic in answering them, uh, and uh, also to engage myself uh, to ensure that I've got all the basics right. But uh, so far, so good. Uh, look forward to the other two standards um, that we'll deal with on Thursday. Sure. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Victor? Uh, I think he, it's all good for me. Mm -hmm. IS-23 borrowing costs, that was, the, that was easy. And IS-20 mm -hmm. IS is the tricky one. Mm -hmm. But I think with more practice, we get to know the concepts. Because mm -hmm. I think what's what's critical is to know the concept and sure. the basics. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. See you. Have any, uh, Hello. Do you have any exercise for for IS twenty that we can look at? I, I'll I'll check. I'll check. I think I'll need to find something and give you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've also sent you the one for the IS uh, that we did. IS yeah, seven. Yeah, IS seven. Okay, okay, I'll look at it. No. So thank you so much, and uh, have your lovely time with your family. See you on All right, thank Thursday. You. Thank you, and bye bye. Thank you. All right. Okay. Cheers. Good night.